Listening comprehension. Now let's begin with the first conversation. Number one. Did Joan get someone to fix the broken window? No, she did it herself. What does the woman say about Joan? Number two. You're from Mayport? There's a big golf tournament held there every year, isn't there? You're right. That golf tournament really put our little town on the map. What does the woman say about the town of Mayport? Number three. This painting isn't an original, it's a copy. How do you know that? What does the man ask the woman? Number four. Do you know where the nearest pharmacy is? There's one in the supermarket on Lexington Street, right next to that big used car lot. What does the woman probably want? Number five. Mandy, did you get a chance to read that magazine I gave you? Cover to cover. What does Mandy say about the magazine? Number six. Jack didn't sound bad at all. Yeah, considering he hasn't played the guitar in years. What do the speakers say about Jack? Number seven. Do you think that I've packed too much equipment for my camping trip? It should be just right, Max. If you plan to be gone for a couple of years. What does the woman imply about Max? Number eight. What should I take with me when I talk to the mayor? I bring a pen and notebook and a small tape recorder. Oh, and a prepared list of questions, of course. What is the woman probably planning to do? Number nine. That couldn't have been Professor Le Guin that you saw yesterday. He's been at a conference in San Francisco all week. Well, it sure looked like him. What can be inferred about the woman? Number 10. There must be something wrong with that microphone the speaker is using. I can hardly understand a word he's saying. Yeah, I can only catch a word or two myself. Why are these people probably having trouble understanding the speaker? Number 11. Would you like to go with me to the airport to pick up Frank? I'd like to, but I have class till 2, and I know Frank's decided to take the early flight. What does the woman imply? Number 12. Did you catch our very own Professor Stiller on TV last night? I almost missed it, but my mother just happened to be watching at home and gave me a call. What does the man mean?
Number 13. These summer days are getting to be more than I can take. It was even too hot to go to the pool yesterday. Hold on. According to the weather report, we should have some relief by the end of the week. What does the man mean? Number 14. My roommate and I have decided to do our own cooking next semester. Then I hope you'll have a lighter schedule than this term. What problem does the woman think the man may have? Number 15. Come on, we're almost there. I'll race you to the top of the hill. No, I'm so out of shape. I might have to crawl the rest of the way. What can be inferred about the man? Number 16. Yes, hello. Uh, this is Robert White calling. Could Dr. Jones see me on Tuesday morning instead of Tuesday afternoon? Tuesday morning? Let's see. Is that the only other time you could come? What does the woman imply? Number 17. I really need to make some extra money. I've practically spent my entire budget for the semester. You should check out the new cafeteria. I think there are a few openings left in the evening. What does the woman suggest the man do? Number 18. Driving at night always makes me tired. Let's stop for dinner. Fine. And let's find a motel, too. Instead of continuing on, we can get an early start tomorrow. What will the speakers probably do? Number 19. This notice says that all the introductory psychology classes are closed. That can't be true. There's supposed to be 13 sections of it this semester. What does the woman mean? Number 20. Whoops. Did any of my coffee just spill on you? It's hot. Is that all you have to say? What does the woman imply? Number 21. No, oh, my shirt sleeve. Must have gotten caught on that nail. Here, let me take a look. Hmm. With a needle and thread, this can be mended and look just like new. What does the woman mean? Number 22. I'm looking for a lightweight jacket. Navy blue, medium. Let's see. Have you checked the sales rack in the back? There were still a few there yesterday. What does the man mean? Number 23. I've figured it all out. It looks like it'll take us about six hours to drive from here to Chicago. It'd be more relaxing to take the train, but I guess we should watch our expenses. What does the woman imply? Number 24. I've been working out at the gym since January, so... I've been wanting to get in better shape. You look terrific. Seems like all your hard work has paid off. What does the woman mean?
Number 25. This heat is unbearable. If only we'd gone to the beach instead. Why, with the museums and restaurants in Washington, I'd be happy here no matter what the weather. What does the woman mean? Number 26. I don't know what to do with Timmy. This morning I found orange juice spilled all over the kitchen floor. Don't be so hard on him. He's only four. What does the woman imply? Number 27. When's a good time to get together to discuss our history project? Other than this Wednesday, one day's as good as the next. What does the man mean? Number 28. Congratulations! I heard your field hockey team is going to the Mid-Atlantic Championships. Yeah, now we're all working hard to get ready for our game tomorrow. What will the woman probably do this afternoon? Number 29. Can you come over for dinner tonight? I'm up to my ears in work, so I'll have to take a rain check. What does the woman mean? Number 30. If you rub some soap on that drawer, it might stop sticking. Well, maybe. But if I took out the paper that's fallen down and back, that would help for sure. What is the problem? Now we will begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 through 34. Listen to a conversation between two teaching assistants. Stan, do you have a minute? Oh, hi, Kathy. Sure. What's up? Well, I've been meaning to talk to you about the situation in the office. I'm not in there very often. It's so noisy that I can't work. That's exactly what I'm getting at. We're supposed to be able to do our preparation and marking in that office. But have you noticed? Jack constantly has students coming in to get help with his course. A lot of people are going in and out. Has anybody spoken to him about it? No, not yet. But someone's going to have to. We can't really ask him to stop having students come in for help, can we? No, of course not. But I'm not able to do my work, and neither are you. I imagine it's the same for the others in the office. Hmm. Could we ask for a kind of meeting room? When TAs have to talk with a student, they could go to the meeting room and not use the office. You know, there's a room down the hall, a rather small room, that we could ask to use. It's only for storing supplies. You mean that little storage room? Oh, that would be too small. Are you sure? With the cabinets taken out, it might be bigger than it looks. Come to think of it, you may be on to something. I'd like to have a look at that room. Can we go there now? Sure, let's go. Number 31. What problem at the office are Kathy and Stan discussing? Number 32. Why do Jack's students come to see him? Number 33. What does Stan suggest they do? Number 34. What does Kathy say about Stan's suggestion? Questions 35 through 38. Listen to a conversation between two students. 
I really appreciate your filling me in on yesterday's lecture. No problem. I thought you might want to go over it together. And anyway, it helps me review. Hope you're feeling better now. I am, thanks. So, you said she talked about squid? Sounds a little strange. Well, actually, it was about the evolution of sea life, a continuation from last week. The octopus and the squid descended from earlier creatures with shells. They survived by shedding their shells somewhere between 200 and 500 million years ago. That's a pretty long span of time. I know. That's what she said, though. To be precise, exactly when they emerged is uncertain, and why is still unexplained. Some squid are really huge. Can you imagine something that big if it still had a shell? Actually, it's because they lost their shells that they could evolve to a bigger size. Makes sense. But some are really huge. I've read about fishermen that caught squid that weighed over a ton. Did she talk about how that happens? Not really, but she did mention some unusual cases. In 1933 in New Zealand, they caught a squid. Let's see here. It was 22 yards long. Its eyes were 18 inches across. Can you imagine? Reminds me of all those stories of sea monsters. Dr. Simpson thinks there are probably even larger ones that haven't been found because squid are intelligent and fast, so they can easily get away from humans. Maybe some of those monster stories are true. Number 35. What topic are the man and woman discussing? Number 36. Why does the man need to talk to the woman about the class? Number 37. According to the woman, what happened 200 to 500 million years ago? Number 38. What does the woman imply about sea monsters? Now we will begin Part C with the first talk. Questions 39 through 42. Listen to a talk given by the Dean of the School of Education. Community service is an important component of education here at our university. We encourage all students to volunteer for at least one community activity before they graduate. A new community program called One-on-One -on -One helps elementary students who've fallen behind. You education majors might be especially interested in it because it offers the opportunity to do some teaching, that is, tutoring in math and English. You'd have to volunteer two hours a week for one semester. You can choose to help a child with math, English, or both. Half-hour lessons are fine so you could do a half hour of each subject two days a week. Professor Dodge will act as a mentor to the tutors. He'll be available to help you with lesson plans or to offer suggestions for activities. He has office hours every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon. You can sign up for the program with him and begin the tutoring next week. I'm sure you'll enjoy this community service, and you'll gain valuable experience at the same time. It looks good on your resume, too showing that you've had experience with children and that you care about your community. If you'd like to sign up, or if you have any questions, stop by Professor Dodge's office this week. Number 39. What is the purpose of the talk? Number 40. What is the purpose of the program the Dean describes? Number 41. What does Professor Dodge do? Number 42. What should students interested in the tutorials do? Question 
questions 43 through 46. Listen to an instructor in a business class. I hope you've all finished reading the assigned chapter on insurance so that you're prepared for our discussion today. But before we start, I'd like to mention a few things your text doesn't go into. It's interesting to note that insurance has existed in some form for a very long time. The earliest insurance policies were what were called bottomry contracts. They provided shipping protection for merchants as far back as 3000 BC. In general, the contracts were often no more than verbal agreements. They granted loans to merchants with the understanding that if a particular shipment of goods was lost at sea, the loan didn't have to be repaid. Interest on the loans varied according to how risky it was to transport the goods. During periods of heavy piracy at sea, for example, the amount of interest and the cost of the policy went up considerably. So you can see how insurance helped encourage international trade. Even the most cautious merchants became willing to risk shipping their goods over long distances, not to mention in hazardous weather conditions, when they had this kind of protection available. Generally speaking, the basic form of an insurance policy has been pretty much the same since the Middle Ages. There are four points that were salient then and remain paramount in all policies today. These were outlined in Chapter 6 and will serve as the basis for the rest of today's discussion. Can anyone tell me what one of those points might be? Number 43. What is the purpose of the instructor's talk? Number 44. Who were the first insurance contracts designed to protect? Number 45. What does the instructor say determine the cost of early insurance policies? Number 46. What does the instructor say about current insurance policies? Questions 47 through 50. Listen to a talk on the radio about a research project. Located at the NASA Research Center in Iowa is a 5,000 gallon vat of water and inside the tank is an underwater treadmill designed by Dava Newman, an aerospace engineer. For four years, Newman observed scuba divers as they simulated walking on the moon and on Mars on her underwater moving belt. She wanted to discover how the gravity of the moon and of Mars would affect human movement. To do this, Newman attached weights to the divers and then lowered them into the tank and onto the treadmill. These weights were carefully adjusted so that the divers could experience underwater the gravity of the moon and of Mars as they walked on the treadmill. Newman concluded that walking on Mars will probably be easier than walking on the moon. The moon has less gravity than Mars does, so at lunar gravity the divers struggled to keep their balance and walked awkwardly. But at Martian gravity, the divers had greater traction and stability and could easily adjust to a pace of 1.5 miles per hour. As Newman gradually increased the speed of the treadmill, the divers took longer, graceful strides until they comfortably settled into an even quicker pace. Newman also noted that at Martian gravity, the divers needed less oxygen. The data Newman collected will help in the future design of Martian spacesuits. Compared to lunar spacesuits, Martian spacesuits will require smaller air tanks, and to allow for freer movement, the elbow and knee areas of the spacesuits will also be altered. Number 47. What did Newman change so that the divers could experience different gravity levels?
Number 48. Why will Martian spacesuits be designed differently from lunar spacesuits? Number 49. What happened to the divers at Martian gravity when the speed of the treadmill was increased? Number 50. What is one way that the design of Martian spacesuits will differ from lunar spacesuits? This is the end of Section 1 of Practice Test A.